Um, good evening. Welcome to the special uh, council meeting of Tuesday, the 18th of May 2021. Are we good to go? Yep. Okay. Um, council acknowledges that we're meeting on the traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pays respects to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with land and acknowledge that they're of continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. We also extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations who are present today. Item two is the acknowledgement to Colonel William Light. The council acknowledges the vision of Colonel William Light in determining the sites for Adelaide and the design of the city with its six squares and surrounding belt of continuous parklands, which is recognised on the National Heritage List as one of the greatest examples of Australia's planning heritage. Item three members is apologies and leaves of, leave of absence. I have um, Councillor Abraham today running late this evening. Are there any other apologies that we're aware of? No. Um, that takes us to item four, which 4.1, which is the draft 2021-2022 business plan and budget engagement outcomes. Um, members, I might just break this into informal so that we can have open discussion and chat um, before we go to the recommendation and I'll pass over to Claire just to do a quick intro to the item. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I'd like to acknowledge and take all the work that Matt's done in the last couple of years in driving a stronger and more engaged response in relation to consultation on the business plan and budget. Um, a few years ago, we would get five or six submissions. I think last year we cracked 100 for the first one year before that, it was just 15. Um, what you'll have before you tonight is the outcomes from the work that Matt's been doing. Um, we also trialled a few new different ways this year. Um, so we have a rich, um, full, completed um, pack of information, some really rich insights into what the community is thinking. Um, so what we'd like uh, to do tonight is just hear your thoughts and feedback um, and then in the next couple of weeks we'll be finalising obviously the budget, um, budget business plan as well as the rating policy long term financial plan, strategic asset management plans for your consideration next month. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Um, members? Questions, queries, council? Like members, I will ask if there's any discussion, questions, queries before we move. So we're actually going to move that we note and receive the report. So thank you, Councillor Hyde. I'll look for a seconder. Councillor Knoll. Councillor Hyde, did you wish to speak to it? I want to draw members' attention to the, uh, some of the responses, particularly when we're talking about our recovery principles. The vast majority of people are um, very supportive of that. Uh, and the same with our major projects. The vast majority of respondents, 87 percent of which are white right players, are very supportive of that. Um, only 11 percent didn't support any of the major projects. So uh, I commend this consultation, and uh, I also noted and discussed with some staff um, today and yesterday about the, the incredible uptake. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, it's uh, phenomenal, and it's not all good feedback, but it's uh, all feedback is good to have. About it. Councillor Canal, did you wish to speak to it? Members? No? Back to Councillor Hyde to sum up. Members to the vote, those in favour, those against, that is carried. Uh, members, Sorry, that we is. That we can have that recorded as well. Um, <coughs> thanks for joining us, Councillor Kira. Unfortunately, it's a very quick item on the agenda tonight. Um, and at this point, we have no further items on the agenda, so I will call the meeting closed, which means that we have 25 minutes what? until...
I advise that the meeting of the committee will be streamed live to the City of Adelaide website and a recording will be published to the internet. Please note that an audio and visual recording is being taken of the meeting. This means that your presence at, and any contribution you make to the meeting will be collected, used, disclosed or published publicly by the Council, including transparent outside Australia. Council acknowledges that we are meeting on traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pays respect to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land. We acknowledge that they are a continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. And we also extend the respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations who are present today. Apologies, we don't um, have any, but Greg, maybe, is he going to be joining us? Okay. Um, and I'll seek a move and a second to, for the minutes of the meeting uh, the committee held on the 4th of May um, to be taken as read and be confirmed as accurate recording of the proceedings of Councillor Williams today for seconder. Councillor Hyde, do you wish to speak Councillor Williams today? Mm -hmm. Councillor Hyde? Not, oh, uh, sorry. Councillor Kerr. Councillor Kerr, sorry. It was Councillor Kerr. Yeah. Um, got to take that to a vote. That's in favour. That's against. Are you voting, Councillor Mum? Um, I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Okay. Well, we are voting in regards to the minutes of the meeting on the 4th of May. Always happy to support. Excellent, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, members, we're going to switch it around. Um, we are not, we're going straight to 4.2 and then we're going to do 4.1 because we have Theo here with us, um, Chair of the Adelaide Central Market Authority. Uh, take that. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Um, Tom, you would open up with me. Thank you, President Member. Uh, just to, to bring the elected members up to, to speed, this is a number of sessions that we've had both with elected members of ACMA and with the Truders Advisory Group. Um, it's another important step uh, as we progress the Charter. I think it's really important to note that the last time the Charter was reviewed was in 2014. And uh, naturally, it's probably run its life that when we're coming into the new centre market arcade redevelopment. And the motion that was put before us to look at a one market approach, we need to revisit the charter. So, tonight is really the opportunity for the chair of ECMA just to provide a little bit of insight in regards to what we've done and, and how we're progressing with that. And also for Mark to answer any questions in regards to the charter discrimination. Um, as I say, we've uh, been doing a lot of sessions, uh, especially the Traders Advisory Group. The last one was on Thursday, which was a very good session. And uh, we will be going back to ACMA on Thursday for board meetings to go through a number of matters as well. So we will progress this with the intent to come back to Council in early June in regards to the uh, draft uh, ACMA charter. So I'll hand over to Mr. Myers if he wants to say a few words. Um, good evening, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity of coming here this evening. Um, I think this is a golden opportunity um, for the Council, ACMA, uh, to work together to resolve something that's 55 years and happening, and that is that we've been able to take back what was the arcade and now have truly a one market approach. That one market approach, um, I thought that it was appropriate, so did the Council. Uh, to sit down and have a look at the Charter uh, for many reasons. Over, over a long and a, and a protracted period of time, um, there's been some issues with the way that the previous Charter was set up, who was managing what, who was looking after the car parking, who was taking control of the asset management. And I think that um, putting all of that together um, at a time when we've got control of the arcade and the market as one, and to be able to expand the market into the arcade without making any changes to the market is a very, very important um, part of unifying the two parts together. One of the other interesting issues is that we've been able to sit down and have a look at the finances and as you've seen recently, there has been some budgets that have come back in and we've been able to trim the sales, so to speak. Our aim is to make sure that we have a world-class market, a very, very, um, 
use this word advisedly, but I'll use it anyway. I think it's important for the market to be there for all people of Adelaide and South Australia. It's very important uh, for the market to be affordable, but at the same time to bring a good return back uh, to its rightful owners, which is the Adelaide City Council. What we're doing um, with the Charter, I think, uh, goes a long way to achieve that, and uh, I'm very grateful for the workmanship, um, a very professional workmanship way that I've been able to work with the administration to bring it all together. Uh, the other thing I would like to ask is, I know that in the Charter and in the past, there's a, we, we meet once a year. I think it would suit uh, ACMA if we were to meet more regular and we could update you and we could have your opinion and there'd be a better working relationship if we could meet three, four times a year. Uh, that way uh, you would fully know what's going on and we would be able to work together with you um, and supply you with any information or questions you might have. At the end of the day, ACMA manages uh, the owners of the Adelaide City Council. Thank you. Over up to the floor for any questions. Anyone? I will move on. Thank you, Councillor Knoll. A number of questions. Um, you know, I'll just go through the, you know, the quick questions and I'll just let you write. Um, and I'll take it the, the dry actual draft will be released to the, to the committee um, in the first of June. But uh, just a question around um, the market car park. Um, so obviously that's all coming back to the council for this. Um, will the focus on that so it still remain the same in that case the focus on the shop? Serious proceeding member, uh, we've actually recognised the importance of this car park as ancillary and supportive of the central market. It is essential to the services of central markets. So the intention is on an annual basis is for both ACMA and the City of Adelaide to work on the strategies associated with that car park to drive visitation and naturally to support the market below. So we'll be looking at various strategies in regards to mix, in regards to pricing and also theming it so that uh, we actually have activities that can actually generate interest beneath the car park. The car park is a means to an end, but it's a profitable means to an end, but that will be recognised within the charter. Um, the, the next section governments are clearly defining the asset management decision making responsibilities. Uh, describe describe how, you, how you want to do that. Through you, Presiding Member, uh, effectively the, the way that the charter is currently set up is that ACMA uh, basically are custodians and finance or actually deliver the capital works. However, we are the landlord, we are the owner of the Adelaide Central Market. So if there was no ACMA, the reality is the cost of the burden and the maintenance and associated activities around that market remains with us. So the intention is as it will be a landlord tenant relationship. And effectively as a landlord, we would be responsible for the capital works and ECMA would be responsible for the management, operation and marketing. So like any of our other capital works budgets for renewal, it would be brought to council on an annual basis for decision. But prior to that, we also will be working on an asset management plan which will define the capital works. So council has to line of sight and start to be reflected in this long-term financial plan. Um, the support services uh, been provided in fact, was that going to include the marketing things like that, or was that, and is that going to also be informed to the cellular like, either, is that sort of through the marketing days, or, or how is that going to work? The three percent member, what we're trying to do is integrate council services. At, at present, we have service level agreements, for instance, with our finance department, who actually service ACMA in regards to their financial needs. But we also recognise as a section 42 subsidiary of council, it's not dissimilar to any other program which we service. So IT services, um, HR services, leasing services um, will be supportive. ACMA currently undertake their own marketing and we believe that probably sits well with ACMA. And we think that's something that they need to drive from a retail perspective and from a tenant perspective. But what we're saying is the services that our councils are provided to the subsidiary as it is provided to any. Yeah, through the chair, the, the maintenance on the uh, maintenance, you know, the everyday maintenance, is that still going to be uh, you know, done on the ground uh, by the people in, you know, the better doing the first place? 
Deputy Member, uh, the, the intention is that the major capital works, the renewal works, will be taken, uh, undertaken by the City of Adelaide. Um, if there's any enhancement works, that will be presented to Council as a business case. But in regards to maintenance, there is a current maintenance budget contained within ACMA's budget, which actually allows them to do the, the fast and nimble things on a daily basis to deal with those items. And we believe it's best suited that we remain with them as the operating management of that facility. Um, just a question regarding the board members, because we are see we're removing the two terms. How are we going to keep them accountable and fresh um, and appropriate to uh, what the department needs? The presiding member, the reason why the two terms was removed is uh, unfortunately there has been times where we have a very quality, good quality board members and unfortunately we have to move those board members on because of the term. However, they, what will be set as KPIs or benchmarks or dare I even say the budget that's adopted by council which talks to the performance of ACMA. Also as the chair of ACMA has indicated they wish to come back on a quarterly basis to talk about performance. So that will give you an indication in regards to the board members, how they're actually traveling. Ultimately, the decision of the board members comes back to through the chair and through council as well. Anybody just make a couple of comments? Sure. Finish it off. Um, not that it's actually written in here, but uh, when, I, when we look at selection panels, etc., for you know, the board, and I just note that with a chair selection, um, it is, uh, you know, seeing the other doesn't have any sort of trainer representative on it. Uh, that at least, uh, uh, you know, say either the Central Market Trade Association president or something isn't uh, taking part in the chair, because that way at least you have a trader representative, um, you know, helping to inform and helping to be part of the process. Um, just thinking about the market, I mean, that we're changing the wording about what's important. I mean, so the question there is, um, you know, how much difficult will the focus be? Obviously, if we if it's, we're doing it well for the locals, then I would expect we're doing it well, well for uh, the overseas and interstate people. And though for the committee that you are talking about, it's three elected, and I gather it's then two independent traders, so that's five traders. Um, and as long as the, uh, the agenda that, uh, is between the board and that committee is uh, you know, the same other than the uh, confidential components, and at least as a transparency for the, you know, the, the traders, etc., and also with the, with the process. Um, and the thing on that, and the general manager, as long as the general manager is um, accountable, certainly to the CEO, but you know, that is still made a, a being directed by ACMA, because obviously they need to work in concert together to make the, the, uh, the market work. And you know, just with the, the, the with the board members to make sure that we we're, have the right mix of KPIs uh, so that they're uh, you know that they are actually delivering for the market and the national the city as well. But otherwise, I, I agree with uh, most of that. Thanks, um, Councillor. Just, I'll, just I'll be mindful. The key questions here um, are in front of you, um, so if we can talk to that uh, or ask any questions related to that general administration, um, move forward with this item. What made you have? Thank you. I just want some clarification between the governance and the key questions and uh, the comments under management. So under financial management, um, it says auditor of City of Adelaide is auditor of ACMA. And in the question, it says City of Adelaide audit committee being ACMA's audit committee, the two different things. So um, are we asking that we are using the same auditor or are we asking that we are using the same audit committee or are we asking for both? Um, I was having a little bit of trouble relating the questions back to the information. Um, in terms of the questions, um, expanding the role to curate and manage the market offering and operations into one market. I think that, that's been discussed before, but absolutely. And um, I think that's the only way we are going to get an integration of that offering. Um, the change of responsibility in terms of managing the car park, and I do note that you have put in the pack that the market would still maintain the ability to work out what the charges are and how that's going to relate to uh, shopping at the central market. That is the understanding. Three percent member has indicated the word earlier is to work out uh, 
commencement prior to the next financial year for ECMA and the city of Adelaide will come together to work out the pricing strategy, the market mix, the things that actually needs to be done in town. Um, the official uh, sub of creating an official subcommittee of the board with um, trade representation. Um, I think is a, a really good way forward. Um, uh, there was another um, corporation that I was on the board of that did something similar um, and which worked very well as a conduit through and to the board, um, which allowed then the representation to be heard and actually get a greater representation, um, uh, especially with the board members on that. So I think that would be a good way to resolve potential conflicts of interest and things like that, which I know is part of the issues that we're dealing with. Um, the support services provided to <coughs> at no, no cost, I'm assuming those are government's finance risk HR. Yeah. And procurement, so um, um, I think that that makes sense, that we would be supporting with those functions. Um, I, and the, the only other one that I wanted to discuss a little bit more was just in terms of acting for an appropriate and agreed return to City of Adelaide, um, how we would look at that in terms of whether that's a percentage return on investment or uh, as a subsidiary, how we would look at what that percentage might be. Uh, through the chair, I think that's a discussion each year with ACMA and depending on the trading circumstances. So obviously through COVID, you wouldn't have expected to return but we provided subsidies. But as the one market concept comes on board, the profitability of the authority will uh, improve markedly and it should be capable of delivering um, a financial return to the council at some point to be discussed and agreed with the board to provide you. Um, Two aspects. We already have a benchmark for return in the existing market. We have a very clear picture of what the return should be, and also um, it's been happening for a long time. Now, with the new section, we're talking about integration. So, what we're talking about is moving um, what we've already got into a new section with some new. Uh, perimeter 24 hour service shops. Um, look, it'll be a working relationship with the council. I believe that there should be a return, but we also have to look at a short term and a long term um, situation because you've got to get the right tenants in at the beginning. So we might have to do some uh, interesting. Um, calculations on rental to bring in the right tenants at the right time, which is when we open the market, and then that rent um, gradually increases. Mm -hmm. um, I guess it's also looking at what services, service or function provision is being given or um, provided by the uh, City of Adelaide administration and, and what's not. So it's just obviously it's a conversation. Um, and I'd also uh, support CO if we can keep on the uh, central market for more frequently than once a year, I think would help, particularly over this period of time. Anyone else? Councilor Martin? Oh, I saw your face. No, thank you. Um, look, just a couple of questions first. Um, uh, can I have, have I, I've heard uh, uh, the councillor uh, uh, express as a trader some concerns about these proposals. Is there an alternative view? I mean, is, is uh, there a, a groundswell of support from traders for these changes to the charter, or are there any other concerns? I'm just interested to know what the general feeling is among traders. Through, through your presiding member, that there's always going to be people who have alternative views. I think the biggest concern for every trader is how it impacts on their bottom line and what happens to their lease values. When they see change, they think automatically that there's going to be an exorbitant increase in lease values. 
Um, however, you know, like any leases, uh, we market test the leases and uh, naturally we also look at the, their performance in regards to their P&Ls. So from our perspective, the ones that were really of concern was what's going to happen in regards to lease values and the new central market archive, what will that do to that? The other one was how TAG is represented. And effectively, from a tag perspective, what we've tried to do, and that's a Traders Advisory Group, is to broaden that out to more people. Instead of one person being represented on the uh, authority, is to have a committee which is legally binding within the Charter, where we would have three tag members, two independents, and two board members. That is minuted, that is uh, recommendations coming from that entity up into the board to be actioned and responded back to. We believe that we've addressed most of them. Um, but again, I can't speak for individuals, but we actually believe the committee structure is probably the best one based on the conflicts when Beck will start to talk about leasing matters, uh, talking about directions in regards to leases, and also naturally when they provide their documents out to board members, if we have tag members, those leasing documents are contained within it, so it's difficult to manage all of that. So we believe it would be very appropriate and we could probably close off most of those matters. <laughs> uh, well, I'll add a little bit to that. We have um, 76 tenancies, so we have 76 different families, views, ideas, and democracy is very, very thick there. Uh, and it's worked exceptionally well. Change always, always brings about um, people thinking, where am I going to be, and is this going to be? Uh, any better for me. The biggest problem that we have at the moment uh, that I can see are people very concerned about rent increase. Um, the situation is that they have leases and the rent is very clear within the leases, so there's not going to be a rental increase in what people have already got. That's, that's in black and white. Uh, the other concern that they have is the issue relating to, well, if the new market is leased at a higher level, then will that automatically mean that the next rent review there's going to be increases in the market? That's not our intention. Our intention is not to do that. Very clearly undertake that that is not our intention. Um, the issue relating to representation um, is very interesting. There are different views, but I think that at the end of the day, um, it's very clear that we need a broad uh, representation <coughs> on committee and not the view of a narrow one or two people. And I think that we need to encourage and bring more um, tenants into the committee room and get their ideas so we know exactly what's going on. This um, situation of running multiple tenancies is not new in, in South Australia. The, the market is the biggest market that we've got and it's run exceptionally well, but I really think that we need to have more and better and bigger representation in order to get correct feedback. And they know their business and they're very, very good at maintaining what they want to do, which is what we want to do for them. Um, and and uh, I'm sure the uh, traders and councillor will take some comfort from that. Um, if I can ask um, about the current relationship um, between uh, the general manager of the market and the city of Adelaide, how does that work? Your presiding member, the general manager, um, directly behind me, um, is an employee of the City of Adelaide. Uh, the CEO is the, the employer on behalf of the, of the City of Adelaide, uh, as is the other staff members within uh, ACMA and who represent ACMA. Um, however, there is a direct line uh, in regards to reporting to the board and the, the general manager actually reports and assists staff board in the delivery of the charter and all the actions within that. Um, so when it comes to matters such as you know, contract and real performance and whatever, that must certainly feed into that, but the employer is the city of that. So uh, this represents a change? That represents a change. There is a very interesting discussion that takes place between Tom McCready and Theo Maris over many issues, but at the end, I can honestly say that we find a resolution to the problem. Um, and, and 
And look, it's a rhetorical question in one sense, but given that close relationship, and it only arises because of this consideration, do we really need to have a board member on the um, ACMA when there is such a close relationship between the general manager, the CEO, and the board? That's the question. Can you see it? I'm happy for anyone to answer it. Um, so through the chair, um, the subsidiaries over many years sometimes have council members on, sometimes have more than one council member on it, and it ebbs and flows depending on what the chamber wants, and it usually um, uh, is delivered at times like this when there's obviously a change around uh, representation or a change around governance. It really is a call for the council to decide um, what the um, political makeup needs to be on the on the board. Um, and just if I may chair in conclusion a couple of comments. Um, uh, I absolutely endorse the expanded role for ACMA, uh, particularly in relation to curating the new arcade offering. Um, it makes fundamental sense uh, and I look forward to seeing that come to fruition over the coming years in regard to the, uh, the structures and the support services and the functions that was proposed that council should manage. I endorse it uh, completely. It's a very sensible, very sensible proposal. Councillor Hyde. Just a quick comment, Jason. Of course, you wouldn't actually be having this workshop in this way if you didn't have a councillor on the board. So it was instigated by that person. Who is me? Um, so, a bringing endorsement, which is great. A procedural question first, um, Chair. Is there a reason we took these papers as read and not work through them as we usually are to work on? Um, I actually made that decision to take them as read. So, is that, is that okay? Oh, no, didn't no, read them? Did you need more time? Or? Usually, no. Oh, I was just right. wondering. Um, and that sort of leads into my second question um, through you, Chair. Why haven't we been provided with an actual draft? I just thought members would have been. This is a workshop, Councillor. This is this is a workshop. There's yeah, a draft a... charter that's prepared. True. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Obviously, um, it'll come to Would you like to ask the question? Through the debate, member, thank you for the question, Councillor. First and foremost, what we've tried to do is to capture the subtle changes within the charter and the intent of the charter. I think it's important to understand what we're trying to define in regard to role governance, financing, operating. The draft charter will be presented back to Council as well as operating guidelines, and that will also be presented to ECMA in advance of being presented back to, to Council for review. The, the that will come to committee, you know, and we've also support that with a table which talks to the amended clauses, and then it'll come to council for consideration. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm looking to understand obviously the current charter design standard talks about the Central Market Traders Association, or it's a name, but we've got the association and we've got TAG. Um, I was wondering if, if we might be able to walk through um, what each of those uh, bodies do, but also what they'll do in the context of this new charter. So the relationship that either or neither of those bodies will have with, with, with the new authority. Through, through you, presiding member. Uh, for, first of all, TAG is a Traders Advisory Body, which is actually captured in the charter. So it's actually referenced in the current charter. It's actually set up as a reference point for traders back into, into ACMA. The Traders Association is a separate entity, another entity. I'm not saying they're a splinter group, but just another entity which is represented. What we can try to encapsulate within the revision of the, the way that we're actually bringing that together is to create a committee which is representatives from TAG and also other independent traders or their as a traders association. Um, they can be represented. We've tried to broaden that in regards to five representatives as opposed to one representative, and that be the two board members. We actually believe that we will, you know, that will actually open up for better dialogue in regards to operations, marketing, management. It won't talk to leases because those lease discussions should be individual between the tenant and the landlord, and that's why we've done it this way. Um, uh, it's look at it from our perspective. Uh, I'd rather see if we could hear from more voices 
and, and that's what we've tried to do. And we had the opportunity of that to tag. And there was uh, some trigger association representatives at the last meeting, I believe, last Thursday. Mm. Certainly, and just chair. The, so, so what, what is the nature of the association to the authority now? Um, and how was that relationship going to become with the new charter? We still a hazy. Yeah, well, so, sorry to start to remember that there is not a direct necessary relationship in regards to, to the current charter tag, it's probably the main entity. However, it does recognize the authority. What we're trying to do is formalize and have more people, which includes the authority, should they wish to, but it certainly includes tra uh, the Traders Advisory Group. Noting that the Traders Advisory Group was created in a way which talked to individual things of retail within within the market for food. That point, you look at fruit and veg, there's representatives from there, you look at uh, meats, representatives from there, and that's how TAG actually came about. So they have a good representation of the board. Sorry, through the chair, the relationship is that the, the board is required to um, engage and communicate only with the traders uh, representative association. So, so we both TAG and the association. It's an obligation just to engage and communicate. Yeah. No, that's good. Um, uh, regarding, and I just want to, I'm still a little bit uncomfortable about this one, so I want to give the administration the opportunity to say in their words um, what, what the problem that we're trying to solve is. Um, uh, very happy with the, the concept of a committee, and I think that's broad engagement and that's really good. Um, uh, very interested to see what the final wording is there. But um, why do we have to have the trader off the board? Um, what what is the what is the one or two big problems that are actually attempting to solve by by doing that? I remember, I'll, I'll start and let Mark come in. The first way I indicated earlier is that the matters that the board considers is not just operational, it's not just management, it's not just marketing. The majority of the work is also talking about leasing arrangements, who's coming in, lease rates, values, and whatever. The fundamental issue that we do not believe, or particularly go advice on that, we do not believe that a trader representative would be best suited to be in that position because they will have information that other traders don't, or they could divulge that information. Um, now, you could say that they could declare an interest in whatever, which is entirely correct. However, the whole board's papers and everything is presented as the whole way through the document has references to that whole relationship and ultimately the role of ACMA is to manage 70 plus tenants. So it was our view that it's better suited to that the tenants, which their real interest is in the operation management marketing and bringing people into the market is best suited to the, to the formation of a committee, whereas ACMA can talk to all those matters in regards to talking about leasing and, that, and that's what they're actually going to do. <laughs> Um, I've got you, that's all right. I'll just let Councillor High finish off. Um, and yeah, and I'm nearly done. Um, the, uh, the board member selection panel um, uh, concerns me as well. Um, look, I was on the, the chair of the board member selection panels previously. Um, I don't want to do it again, but um, I can't believe the ruling. But, um, uh, Two, two problems. One, there's there's four people on there, and I think it's it's an issue when you have a panel with an even number of people on there. That's the decision. First of all, secondly, two two staff, the CEO and the, the head of HR, um, and then I think it was the Lord Mayor and Councillor. Um, I'm very loath to have staff either equal to or out, you know, out balancing um, the elected member representation on there. Um, I would have thought that the HR um, component of that is actually more of a secretarial duty is to support the actions of the panel, um, not to actually sit on that and vote. Um, what, is there reasoning there? Is that something we should just suggest changing when it comes through? Or? Through your presiding member, uh, without being overly critical of the HR person, we'll be talking about a very experienced practitioner who deals in employment legislation. We also know the calipers, and they're also the people who are actually generating the ads and running the recruitment. So I would believe that their input and expertise is probably essential, that that's what they do on a regular basis in regards to recruitment. However, if it's comes as well to, to change that, we're happy to look at that, but we do believe that is an appropriate mechanism when it comes to recruitment and legislation. 
see it as important uh, legislation. Yeah, so I wasn't suggesting that we don't take their advice or listen to them. I was suggesting that they can do all that and provide advice, much like we do here, we have to be a panel the committee. Our administration gives us advice and we make decisions on that basis. Can I ask the question, does that apply to the selection of council representative on the board? Well, this is well, through the chair, the council makes the decision, so as it's the council's plan. <laughs> almost every time. Uh, just, um, just finally, just feedback regarding the actual, um, uh, the actual questions um, uh, through you, Deputy Lord Mayor, regarding the audit committee. Um, I think, uh, I think it would be very handy if, if the minutes of the Central Markets Audit Committee um, actually would come through to us um, for noting at the City's Audit Committee. Um, I think that would be a very good um, mechanism. I, don't, I, I do think they should maintain. I think it should be integrated, and I think there should be two. There should be one for the market, and there should be one for um, that. That works with the city, by the way. Um, uh, uh, just on that sorry, point. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Just on that the, the intent is that the city of Adelaide's audit committee is the audit committee for the central market, so there's going to be one set of minutes. Yes. So the central market authority has the ability to set up a risk and governance committee if it chooses to, and I think that that's the will of the, so the chair and the board members that we've spoken to. So if those minutes need to go through to the city of Adelaide audit committee, that, that could be the case, but there is no separate audit committee for the um, central market authority. Yeah, it, it obviously does need to be integrated so that we, us, we are aware of the, the overall risk. Um, it'll be a slightly diminished role um, for the risk role, but that's, you know, that's much for much. Um, the important thing is that we have something at the market, close to the market, identifying issues there, which is, of course, what I raised in the last workshop, so just get rid of it entirely. Um, we sit in order committee. There's lots of things on the agenda, and I just don't think some of the issues will get the attention they deserve. So, um, uh, and uh, no, look, the rest of it, the rest of it, by the way, but uh, it's an excellent, it's an excellent report. Um, I'm very glad to see this work come through. I know I put a deadline on it originally, um, uh, but uh, I'm glad you're taking the extra time to do it. Councillor Moran. I have to chat more about You know. We used to have, when the council ran the um, market, um, I agree with your um, assessment that trader maybe it was always difficult up at Francis and um, that young bloke who used to be on council that had a good used to be my trader representatives and they were out of the room when they were in the room. Um, so I can understand the thing there. But we also used to have a shopper representative, which sounds a bit sort of twee, but I might, we had a few of them, the last one was Tess Crotty, um, and I know that she and some other shoppers, I don't know whether she still runs it, runs a very cool brand of the Central Market, um, and she was terrific, um, coming completely from a shopper's viewpoint, a, you know, dedicated, passionate shoppers. Um, would it be of any interest to have somebody like that occasionally, um, you know, giving shopper feedback? Absolutely. Um, the customer, is everything to the market, and it would be a very, very good idea. Um, I'd like to do it more formally than just occasionally. Um, well, I would too, but I didn't want to... Uh, yeah, no, I'm very there. happy. Uh, I know that the test particularly is catching about the market, and he's linked in with a lot of uh, others, um, diehards of people that really use the market. Um, and are passionate about it. And I, I, I know when I chaired the market that her input was was so valuable. I mean, I was a, a user of the market, but not in such a passionate way. And they were weird. She, her input was just gold. Um, and the traders, um, I think you were there, Francois, sort of tested from it. Um, and the traders really valued, I think, the input um, from the. Uh, well, don't you remember that? Like, you're on for like 10 years, Jesus Christ. Um, but um, the, I know that the uh, the traders in the market were really interested um, in what the uh, shopper said and find nuances when they could shop, when they couldn't shop, what they wanted to shop for. And so if, if that could be included in that. Um... Absolutely. And I think the other thing that we uh, need to be very mindful of is 
um, what the shoppers actually want to have as available in the market. And, um, recently, we were talking to um, some very, very keen shoppers, and one of which happened to be a previous member of this council, and the deputy lord mayor. And the very first thing she said, "I cannot buy a roast chicken in this market." Um, I never thought about it, that ever. But <coughs> talking to the public and talking to the shoppers is a very, very important issue. And that's one of the things that we intend to do. Well, it's good that you bring it up. That because um, when, one of the things we discussed a lot in that when there was no subsidy <coughs> was the changing shopping habits of women uh, are not being sexist, but they do tend to still be the person that. Uh, our mothers <coughs> tended not to work. My generation, your generation, you know, um, was going into the workforce. Now our daughters' generation all work, and um, the times for markets were open. And also, what was offered. Um, I've been critical of pre-prepared food, as you know, but I'm changed. I'm shifting my ground on that, and that's coming from shopper feedback of young women. Not my age, but young, hey, young women. Hey, and uh, so I think that, that certainly has changed my mind on what the market should offer um, and what it used to offer. So, uh, anyway, I'll leave that with you. Okay. okay. That's all? That's it? No other questions? No, uh, nothing else to discuss in regards to this matter? Thank you very much, Theo and Mark. We're moving on to item, uh, well, I don't know that was 4.1, but make having as 4.2, economic and investment strategies, city growth. We have, um, Tom, you wanted to present on this one as well, a little bit, or? Sorry, remember. Oh, sorry, Mark. Can I just allow the CEO to actually see you? That's right. Yeah, that's right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so thank you and thank you Mark and Tom. I'm going to talk to you and work you through um, uh, quite a full slide deck tonight that most of it will be familiar with. Um, obviously a lot of this work um, was commenced uh, during COVID um, and in December um, we received this motion that was going to require a different financial time and challenge that we were facing as a city and an organisation. Um, Mark will talk through um, some various um, options for you tonight to consider. One of the big shifts that I think I'd like us to see is actually um, head towards having a policy in place that does enable us to agree the principles associated with a return on investment approach. Um, over many years, my experience has been that many um, many times that we've tried to talk to uh, what new revenue looks like, um, we hear the Chamber tell us or ask us what are the new parts of the 21st century, where is Council's revenue going to come from? The challenge has always been without having the principles or the policy piece in place to help inform administration about the types of things and the type of or the level of ROI that we should be um, aiming towards. It's made it very challenging for us to be able to bring that back into a useful format for council to consider. So tonight Mark will uh, work us through some um, some content and some slides and hopefully um, in the coming weeks we'll be able to come back to you with more of a comprehensive policy position for you to consider. John. Thank you, CEO, the presiding member. So uh, as the active scenes indicated, uh, this was a council resolution, a decision of council uh, as part of uh, reviewing this budget process. Um, also, it was raised to the audit committee in regards to uh, effectively where we start to work towards achieving surplus. What Mark's going to go through tonight is to keep you on the journey, and I think that journey is important to note uh, in regards to how we start to transition. We'll talk to tax base, we'll talk to revenue base, we'll talk to opportunities. 
But as the FEC has indicated, we're trying to get a clear policy position and looking at returns and investments and certain business models and formulas. The reality is we'll be bringing things in. We want to have a little bit more control. So council has the comfort and assurance that we're actually achieving our targets before we make a decision. So this is what we're going to go through. So what I'll do is I'll just put to, first of all, the key question, which is asked before you. Before anyone responds to it, I'll let Mark go in. But what we're trying to go to look at is effectively pursuing strategic property development, seeking to reduce leakage from council's rate space, which Mark will talk to, and increasing commercial revenue from sources. And that's just a way of an example. The reality is there's other examples. The interesting thing I would say is if we knew what those commercial opportunities were, we'd probably be doing them by now, as with everyone else. So uh, we're trying to look at that, but certainly that we'll talk to car parking, we'll talk to other opportunities as well. But I'll hand over to Mark just to get this started. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for the opportunity, members. Um, Really by way of background, you've been operating in deficit for the past four years and reasonably substantial deficits. In November 2020, the operating deficit was forecast to be 39 million. The borrowings were forecast to get up to 92.8 million. Um, that's a position that's clearly not financially sustainable and it's contrary to the provisions of the Local Government Act, which require you to operate in a financially sustainable manner. Um, your independent audit committee members recommended you adopt a service um, funding model which is consistent with the Act. So, why have you been in deficit is the key question, I guess. Your rate of the dollar has been frozen for a period of time. The value of that 16 odd million. Um, COVID impacted significantly, a $21 million impact. We provided COVID funding support. We've invested $123 million in new capital and major infrastructure upgrade projects since 2018. That's a substantial sum of money. Not all of project costs are capitalised, so they do impact your deficit uh, or surplus deficit position. And importantly, there's leakage in your council rating base, which has been touched on before in the chamber, but um, universities, for example, which are exempt from rating, uh, operate substantial um, commercial enterprises, if you follow the press at the moment, you will see that um, they're complaining about the lack of overseas students, which goes to the essence of your commerciality. So your essential service provision and infrastructure has been impacted by barriers such as rate capping, cost shifting from other things of government, and, and the ability to rate certain areas of the city. Um, that's what we've come to. Um, the council's response was to grow the tax base to achieve financial sustainability as opposed to taxing your existing revenue base. To do that, you will need to maximise commercial opportunities current and future and become less reliant on council rates, which is we come to as a little bit of a double edged sword. But, um, the response from your administration has been an efficiency and effectiveness one. Um, the process of saving $20 million was underway in November, but not locked down. That's now been locked in. Those savings are locked in. And you have an improved financial position we will come to. So that's come through reshaping the organisation in terms of people, in looking at the services that you provide, particularly the projects, and your infrastructure costs. So. The, um, the growth of the revenue base will need to come with um, council commitment and council direction. 58% of your revenue is derived from council votes. That's a, a very low percentage by South Australian local government standards. 31% is classified as generally commercial revenues. Uh, that's an area that you can grow. I do believe there's room to grow your council rate base as well. And we are going to talk about that. And the balance is essentially revenue derived from grants, subsidies, and statutory fees. Uh, despite the rate fees freeze, it's important to recognise that council's rate income has grown for new developments and revaluations over the past five years. So you've averaged uh, about four percent growth, I think, on average over those five years, and you can see those percentage changes in each of those years: um, two percent in 2021, and the lowest. Uh, Increase in council rates in the is 2%. That'll become important when we talk about the um, provisions in the long term plan. But just to give you an idea of other councils' rates as a percentage of their total revenue, the uh, larger councils in South Australia are all up around the 80% um, 
uh, revenue um, as a percentage of total revenue for gross revenue. So you have much less reliance already. Um, the impact, of course, is that when you have a, a downturn in your commercial revenues as COVID through actually, you face a much bigger challenge than those other councils did, and you um, received much greater criticism than those councils did at the time, and much greater scrutiny. So um, be careful what you wish for in a sense of um, diversifying uh, to an extent. What's changed since the uh, November figures is that uh, and there's a table there that shows you the deficit which was forecast in your long term plan, December 2020 forecast, and where your the table above shows your surplus now. So there's quite a significant turnaround in revenues. Um, your new development in your long term financial plan is forecast to grow at 1% of revenue. You've averaged for in the last five years. So I would say your long term plan is relatively conservative on that basis. The worst you've done in those five years is 2%. But that does make a material difference. That's not reflected in your turnaround numbers. In my view, it could be reasonably um, without being unduly aggressive. I think you've been quite conservative. The long-term plan shows that commercial revenues have bounced back and probably much stronger than anyone thought in November, December, January last year. Um, that's been a very positive thing. There is an ongoing impact of $4.7 million worth of budget repair measures um, and the full year impact of $20 million of savings is reflected in those numbers. So what it does show you now is you have an operating surplus in each year of your long-term plan which was not the position um, back in December that you were forecast to have significant losses at school. Um, what it does show me when I look at those that financial data is you've got very limited financial capacity in the early years of that plan, or well, next year is you know, effectively break even. Um, it would rely on, um, dare I say, heroic financial discipline from uh, council to achieve that without adding new expenditures over the course of any year. Um, in 23 and 24, you don't have a lot of capacity there. The um, surpluses out in the out years, I think, are uh, uh, the level of financial uh, capacity to allow council to make decisions to vary things during the course of the year. So I think your first three years are a little tight. If I'm right. Um, what it shows in your dashboard view of life over the 10 year plan is that the operating surplus is a problem. It is not a problem, it's marginal for the first three years. Your asset sustainability ratio at 60% is the only red indicator on your dashboard at present. Um, the rest of the plan is budgeted on the midpoint of your asset sustainability ratio at 100%. Um, all of those indicators are council leaders that you can pull um, to manage your financial position. But from my perspective, uh, the first three years of the budget are a little um, tight. So the, the financial leaders that you oh, sorry, no, financial leaders. So the financial leaders that you have as a council, revenue maximization, you can increase revenue from existing sources. In business that's the easiest thing to do. So one way to do that would be to reduce the leakage that you have from the council rate notes. You provide a number of exemptions, you um, have policy rules to play that would reduce that leakage. You could review your fees. Councils, um, your market prices, you should benchmark your pricing. Some of your pricing is probably below market. Overseas and interstate, councils can charge a higher fee for faster processing time for providing a different level of service that people want to pay for. That's an option that's open to you to increase your revenues if you choose to. You can increase the number of transactions with your customers as well. Um, or you can create new revenue streams, which is a much more difficult business strategy, um, which is one of the reasons that the failure rate for startups is so high. It's hard to do things you're not good at. What I'm going to talk to you tonight about is do the things that you are good at, um, but perhaps a little more aggressively than you've been doing. I think the great strength of the city is you've got 321,000 people in the city each day. That, that's an opportunity to increase transactions with those customers and you need to start treating those customers. So from an economic policy perspective, um, you're trying to support owner 
higher growth. Let's see in 2030 targets. Tom, did you want to talk about those targets? Yes. So the, the last survey that was undertaken, uh, we currently uh, at that stage had uh, 26,177 residents. Now that's spread between uh, rentals and uh, owner occupiers or people who effectively either have mortgages or own their houses outright. But the highest proportion of that is rental. Um, the biggest risk and biggest threat to the city at the minute is in regards to the overseas rental market, because naturally the overseas tenants can't get back into the country. Um, so naturally, uh, I know that everyone's working on um, naturally the providers to see how they can actually change that around. But uh, if you look at the average annual residential population growth rate, the average is around five per annum every year. And uh, residential forecast uh, for 2030, noting this was done prior to COVID, was 40,994. It'll be interesting to see when the next uh, survey is done what that means, noting that uh, residential uh, through tenancies and through uh, students has actually decreased. So we'll be waiting to see what happens when that starts to come through. Thanks, uh, Tom. I think your long-term plan is showing your rate revenue growth is close to 3% at present based on um, the combination of new developments and revaluations. So the things that you have been putting in place are working and are reflected in your financial position. But what you need to do is develop an investment strategy to harness your future funds so you can create new revenue streams from there. Now that, that should be funded through the sale of underperforming assets and from the profits of those new revenue streams if you start to quarantine those. You, you have a policy framework in place which um, will work to some extent, but you need an investment policy and we'll talk about that. Your land acquisition and disposal of land and infrastructure policy does need some amendment. Um, you, you should strengthen your ability to acquire land. Um, very much part of growing the revenue basis goes back to land banking, strategic sites, and investing in the appropriate time. Um, you have an existing treasury policy, which I think will work for what you need to do. So in terms of uh, the growth agenda, your economic policy objectives increasing your rating base. So over occupier incentives can be effective in stimulating population growth, standard offsets, short-term cancer rate reductions, um, subject to means testing. You're doing some of these things now, if, if not all of those. Um, you have uh, the potential to improve your commercial revenues. You should benchmark your off-screen car parks to make sure they are delivering commercial rates of return. I think to do that effectively, you need some internal reporting adjustments. I think it would be fair to say to get full cost attribution to those areas, and the administration is well aware of my views on that, and I think they're generally quite supportive of that. Um, you can increase your on street parking spaces and revenues. That doesn't mean putting up a trucks, you could actually just have the number of people who park all day in areas of the city for no fee that could potentially be revenue generated for council. Um, there's some caveats on those, I might come to that. I think you have two income producing assets which aren't. Um, income producing at present in the golf course in the aquatic centre because they have not had the level of investment that a business owner would make in those in some respects similar to what we talked about with that one. So you have a choice to make to invest in those assets if you want to generate revenue from them. You won't generate commercial rates of return at the moment given the state of those assets. I think the other thing that we um, which is very important is you do understand property, you understand what's happening in your city you should leverage your property, property portfolio. And that should be uh, two ways. You can acquire property where you see an opportunity. Um, you can actively work with developers to um, extract the value from your existing assets. You have a large property portfolio with a lot of underperforming assets in it, which I know has been a subject of a strategic property review. But you more actively need to leverage that property portfolio if you want to generate growth. And, um, in terms of your financial leaders, your council rate space, 27% um, of that is full-time exemptions, rebates and discretionary rebates. Your discretionary rebates are 370000 a year. Your special discretionary rebates are 1.3 million. You should review those as a matter of urgency. That is leakage in your council rate base.
I would also advocate for reforms of the Act to be the basis for some exemptions and rebates. Universities got exemptions worth $7.8 million. Uh, hospitals have health rebates of $1.5 million. If there's money uh, left on the table, there it would be uh, in council's pockets. Your rating policy, you've got the vacant land uh, uh, rating policy, which I think has gone out as part of this budget process. So again, that's I would see that as a way of encouraging development by uh, having differential uh, vacant land rates. So provided this incentive to be following land for development. But also recognise that you do provide infrastructure and services to that land that's empty or vacant. Um, and you've got discretionary rebate powers if you choose to exercise them. But um, it is potential to raise another $300,000. Know, that's $2 million we talked about actually getting exemption from the universities. So um, not small numbers. Uh, other alternatives that other councils have done uh, both here and interstate. Um, if you want to invest in the, the assets of a golf course and a product centre, um, because um, you don't want to tax your existing rate base, why not provide them an incentive for city residential rate base to have a membership to golf or for a membership to a product centre in exchange for bringing a special council rate to fund some of those projects? Um, very unpopular sitting here saying you can introduce a special vote, but I do I'll think try. it's, <laughs> yeah, I'll try that, Mark, it's so a tool that does. other councils use quite successfully. And I think in some of the modelling that I looked at, you will benefit for a city residential vote, okay? and that's the city residents would be equal to a special rate to fund the same approach. It's not a thing. It's not a, it's not out of the, might be politically out of the question, but economically it's a, a, a really, valid thing for you to think about. And if you can demonstrate to the residents who've got a membership of a common value, I think it's worth pushing it away out of Financial levers, your on-street car parking, um, you have, uh, if you introduce the pay to pay parking in those bays that are being used, used at the moment, there's potentially on the modeling that we've done $340,000 of revenue to um, generate. There's, Potential to expand paid parking to other land roads, that's another half a million dollars that's there. You can introduce dynamic pricing link to the off-street routes. You have levers available to, to increase your revenue from these sources. Yes, you should provide resident exemptions. This is about people who are using city services and facilities um, and not paying for them at present. So I'm suggesting that this, you know, close to another million dollars in your financial leaders from your existing businesses, the things you can't do, you have control over the assets. And there's very little cost to them. Your council car parks, you should achieve benchmark commercial returns, if you like, equivalent to paying a commercial rental and paying a commercial return on the investment you have. To do that, you need full cost reporting because you can't manage those things without the full cost loss and measure and report performance, including to this chamber on a regular basis so that you can see what your commercial assets are doing for you. And if you've got a commercial asset that's underperforming, you should know about it and you should um, encourage your administration to do something about it. I do think you should look at asset investment in the car park. We've got strategic sites around the city where um, other car parks may be beneficial. But I think you should recognise that Car parking is a, a business that may not be there in the long term as things change. So you should have an exit strategy. You should pick a time frame that's a regular report coming back to council to say we want to be out of car parking, not at the end of the time, but you want to get some value for your asset base and sell it on at some point if you chose to, as you change your um, investment rates over. But you need a long term view of that. Don't assume we'll be in parking forever. I'm old enough to remember when the council had the Winfield in the country because I worked there at the time and it's a significant revenue base. It no longer has that. You won't have car parking in Winfield. So get used to it. So um, rates income from growth has been about 4% over the last five years. What we know about your major developments is your lodgement value is $1.1 billion worth of property has been lodged for development in the city. In the last 12 months, half of a billion dollars has been approved. So your increasing rates from growth is coming. 
the, the city is an attractive place for you to, for people to invest. The city of Adelaide can have market influence, and you should use your council property portfolio for that. You have, as we've um, shown with the Central Market Arcade, air rights that are valuable enough, some of those properties in addition to the value of the land itself. I think that the strategic property review is a very um, forward thinking document. I think it could go much further if this council um, fits the will of this council to do so. Just to show you, I think you've seen this picture recently. Um, it, it's not mine, but I'd like to see the size of the development. What struck me there, of course, was Lot 14 in Sandy. You don't get rates from those mm. buildings. Significant developments. Mm. And I look at the uh, beautiful boulevard that's North Terrace and think about how much money has been spent there by this council. And I try and take that, I feel like you generate for me, it does bother me. Um, mm -hmm. It's nil. Yes, it does bother me. So, leverage your property portfolio. You should buy property, you should develop existing property, and you should sell property that's outlived its usefulness to you. Or has no strategic purpose in the future. But be prepared to consider all three of those things all of the time. So your property that you can buy land to land back, uh, the, the value of land for West of Adelaide as the hospital was built, um, you're aware of those sorts of developments well before the general market. You know what's happening in the city. You know land, you should take advantage of that. There's a lot of stock of C and D grade buildings around the present which need to be redeveloped, and someone needs to take an active um, stance in the market to do that. The council is well placed to do that. You will, as we will come to the rates of return you need to achieve compared to a private developer quite low because your weighted average cost of capital is less. And you also have different objectives, right? You're, so if we talk about development, you have city shaping opportunities. You've taken two city shaping opportunities in the central market of our and have you had our street, I think that there's scope to do more. Um, I wouldn't advocate becoming a developer uh, with council only resources. I think one of the things you should look to is joint venture or partner or acquire expertise. In the uh, landfill that I chair, we are in three joint ventures, one that produces energy because the people in the joint venture know how to produce energy, we just have to the methane. Uh, we have another joint venture that recycles plastics because they don't know how to manage the recycling facility with some commodities. We just happen to have a supply of commodities. And we have another around the uh, extraction of going from the um, So we've gone out and said we we've got something to contribute. We have land, we have knowledge of the, the city, you're a very good joint venture partner. So I've worked with developers, you've got Plenty of leaders like the very consideration for land, which should dominate our concept. That's been, I, I doubt whether the development would have gone ahead to the extent that it has if you weren't prepared to take those commercial risks as a council. So if you're doing these things now, I'm saying you should give more. So you should sell land as well, but you need to have a policy objective to do that, which should be done to stimulate growth or to facilitate city shaping opportunities or where the land is generally surplus to your needs and there is land in your portfolio needs. So some of the graphics of the things that we've been going to intervene in the market there and I can't wait till I see those uh, in the city skyline which you look at. So remove the poor quality C and D rate off the stock in the market. Um, you can facilitate that through acquisition, you can redevelop it, you can repurpose building, you can change use. You've got plenty of structures that are available to you to do those things. Um, you might choose to do it to support a broader strategy, you know, tech industries, the digital economy, or residential growth, or affordable housing. There's plenty of leaders available to you to do those things. Now, you can also um, sell mating rights. Um, you can have commercial partnerships to offset costs. You can generate revenues from dual boards and digital formats. That Revenue has been estimated by others to be $2 million per annum if you choose to go down that path. Councils interstate do this uh, much more than we do here. That to me is um, because I think that you should focus on the things you know or, or have some interest in knowledge in. I would think that that's a contractual opportunity or a joint venture opportunity. 
Um, apologies to the four names and waste management services is an opportunity that can generate revenue as well. Um, I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with um, reverse vending machines, the CDL um, models. So you can establish you can establish uh, CDL facilities in the city, so reverse vending machines creates important opportunities. On a million dollar investment, you will get a 12% over return on that. It's a reasonable investment. It fixes an environmental problem because you have um, material that's disposed of in your general waste bin, which has actually got a value beyond the recycle of 26 that you get back. Um, childcare facilities. There, are, there is one case in South Australia that has a childcare facility and they do generate a surplus from it. We can't call it profit because we have national competition policy issues, but they do generate a surplus from it. The city of Plato did have childcare facilities and dispense them because they found it too hard to manage. Interstate councils do those things. To me, childcare facilities uh, generate the 8 to 10 percent return on investment. But you can do the other reasons. You can do it to attract workers to the city. So you've got reasons to have um, those. Again, there are, there are plenty of operators who will happily set up childcare facilities in conjunction with council and council facilities if that was a part of their plan. Never lose sight of the 321,000 people you've got coming into the city. So, the investment policy. Um, I think that the council needs to agree. Um, its investment goals and objectives. And I think as part of the policy, you need to define and assign responsibilities for investing in activities, whether that's uh, that, that committee, its delegations, that's a decision for the council. But you also need an investment strategy when you have a fund that you're trying to work with. So including asset allocation, including what your investment horizon is, what your risk and return appetite is. Investing in city shaping initiatives, you might seek a lower rate of return than you would from flipping a building. Um, or, or you might not, it's entirely um, the decision of the people who control that policy. You need to have a basis for reporting and evaluating performance. You should recognise if you go down this path that those decisions need to be taken in confidence and councils um, have a predisposition generally to being as open and transparent as they can. So you need to look at what your structures can do that. Your policy objectives um, for me are stewardship. You should safeguard the fund over the long term. So I would put it all in a cryptocurrency, for example, like my children might. Um, you need to maximise the return on investments within your risk profile. You need it to be liquid and you need to have cash flow to meet your future cash flow needs. So Making sure there are funds in the fund to invest is actually very important to the objectives. I think the other thing that the council needs to do is um, make sure that an investment decision reflects the values of the city of Adelaide. So, uh, an investment in coal mining, which would be unacceptable in many public institutions, um, might need to be specifically excluded. So, there are things that was responsible investing from a public body. Policy uh, your investment principles, you need to be flexible in your approach to investment opportunities without placing limits on your terms. You need to be nimble in those things. The safeguard you have as an elected body is you have a prudential management policy as well, which anything that's coming out of the future fund, I think, would have to be would, would trigger the prudential management policy thresholds and then. That in turn would trigger your, your treasury policy thresholds at present. So um, you need to specify your objectives, achieve an acceptable rate of return, um, depending on what those objectives may be, and then allocate your capital and intervene in the market. I don't, I don't think you should necessarily be competitive in the market. From my perspective, if you're a public body, you need to intervene in the market for other reasons. You need to work out what your turn on investment you want by like the investment price. Your weighted average, your return should be your weighted average cost of capital, typically, plus a risk free rate, plus a premium. And on the next slide, I think, um, I think in the papers I have the return, I think it's by 6.56 because I changed the risk premium later in the case. 
But as a council, your weighted average cost of capital is less than 2%. Most developers are be 5 or 6%. So if you think about the return you need to generate, you can either say, I've got 4% up my sleeve, um, which makes you an attractive joint venture partner, or you can increase the return of the sort of commercial development one twelve percent on most of us. But with, with a whack of 2% and a risk-free rate, which is usually the Commonwealth um, bond rate, which is down at 1.6% at the moment, and a risk premium range in your policy of 2 to 4%, you'll end up with an investment return of 7.56%, which is a reasonable return when you look at the components that make that up. Uh, there are lots of investments where you generate more than 7.56%. So I think, um, I think addressing your rates of revenue growth by looking at leakage and engaging in strategic property actually will encourage more development, you'll achieve your rates of revenue growth objective that you're looking for. I think that the council should consider expanding its revenue base through um, parking, through advertising, um, and through any of the other opportunities that have been mentioned. Parking is easy because you have a significant market presence in your understanding the industry. Advertising is easy because you have space in the city that you could advertise from. Uh, Childcare centres in CDL are part of businesses and I would look for a higher return on those than I made from advertising itself. So through your presiding member, just a, a series of questions, but just to know, the most important piece of this also is to come back to council with uh, looking at the treasury policy, looking at the investment policy as a new document, and that should even have a, a land and acquisition and disposal policy, which certainly needs to reflect council's intent, but also to reflect what we went through in regards to taking property review so we can actually reconcile within it. We've got a series of questions in, in here, but also open to any other suggestions. But it, it, inherently, what Mark is saying is uh, without guidance in regards to return on investment, uh, bringing in things individually, we actually like to standardize it so we can actually approach it so that we're actually achieving the returns that we want. And just in summary, uh, just based on what Mark has done and uh, explained, we've transitioned from December 2020 to now where we were showing uh, net deficits in our budget to now uh, minimum net surpluses for the first three years, but then increasing as a major turnaround in regards to, to the organisation. But uh, we'll have that for you if there's any questions. Now, this, Councilor Martin. Yeah, I, uh, I'd like to ask about uh, rates leakage and in particular. Uh, the income that's foregone from universities, hospitals and the like, which was identified as the major cause of rates leakage. And uh, given your experience, Mark, I'm sure you can tell us which local government area in Australia has managed to persuade hospitals, universities, federal and state agencies um, to pay rates. Uh, I, th I think um, if you look at people like the airport, they the rates of equivalent. Uh, rate to the city of West Island, for example. So there is, um, there are two leaders available to There's a, a discussion and negotiation position which could take with those universities and say, we think you're a commercial business and we think that some form, I'm not saying the full amount of your public, but if a university's business was 10% commercial, then I would be saying that should be reflected in the rates of good rates paid to them. I think the Commonwealth has a rate system to uh, pay for that number of councils. So, it's not an immediate fix, Council. It's, it's something from a policy position I think is actually um, the exemptions provided for different purposes. And I think it's time that we recognise that the business of the university is actually a business of the university that is goes rather than um, to be an education institution. Uh, Chair, I don't disagree with that at all, but I'm just wondering which local government area is persuading universities and hospitals to do this as an example for us. I'm happy to come back to you and look into state to see the extent that they have the current South Australian Act doesn't permit us, but it has to go to the state government. So if we could persuade the state government to agree, then we'd be on the way. Lord Mayor, if I could just make some comments on that, because um, I have actually uh, spoken with three universities around um, the rights. So universities like the University of Adelaide do pay rates on commercial operations within the university. 
Um, and uh, at, at the moment, given the, you know, what the universities are facing with the um, inability to have instructional students here, uh, I don't think it's a conversation that will go down particularly well. Um, the, the other thing, so one of the conversations or around the conversations that I've been talking to the universities is around the facilities management because we look after cleaning, maintenance, water culture up to that point. And then there's a different facilities management that looks after it. So uh, a lot of conversations around how we might work better together. So um, that, that facilities management fee may then become a rate base to the city of Adelaide, for instance, in exchange for facilities management. Um, that's to open the conversation. They've also had that conversation uh, with the state government. Um, Triple CLM has done some work here, and in particular, Victoria is doing a big review of the rate space uh, across any education state government on facilities. Um, and since the Lord Mayor is answering these questions, um, uh, when you say Victoria is doing it, is that the state government, the local government association, council? Who's doing the review? So they're doing the review through the local government association on behalf of the uh, council. So just the information. Okay. Um, so um, can I ask then how we might tackle this for the state? I mean, is it a legal action or is it just lobbying or what? That is persuading our state to agree to allow us um, to tax hospitals and so on, uh, whatever rates component. We can get Tom, any terms of that? Who are you presiding member? I think the first one is we need to have a uh, consultation. and make them aware that uh, we've identified this as, uh, as a matter that the service seeks review. I pick up with the Lord Mayor's indicated in regards to universities and the significant hardship they're going through with COVID. So uh, we need to tread very lightly in regards to this. But uh, again, there is an opportunity here which Mark has identified. Um, and that particularly talks to the commercialization of those facilities. But I think it's well worth it to have the conversation at a more senior level to see what is possible. So it's not just. Um, Sorry, to the chair, I just want to um, give some context. Obviously, a lot of this is already identified last year when we brought in uh, a workshop that council members on reviewing the rating policy. Members will remember that had not been reviewed for a number of years. Um, we've just consulted on our rating policy for the first time, and that'll be coming through to you, um, to committee and to council for consideration um, in the next cycle of committee and council meetings. So um, at that point in time, obviously members will be able to have a, um, a discussion around other um, certain aspects of the rating policy that members would like um, more active um, activity undertaken. Um, in relation to some stuff that Mark's touched on tonight. That the, the appropriate um, consultation is through the LGA, I think, because you're not the only council that's impacted by this issue. Um. And um, sorry, but on the back of the discussion that we did have through the workshop, Council did ask us um, to have those conversations. Um, the previous uh, CEO, Mark, had also um, had various um, CEOs across um, Adelaide who um, have universities in their um, local authorities um, reach out to, to Mark and ask Mark to do a piece of work with them, um, along with the LGA uh, and the recent government meetings with those CEOs. Um, and also with the LGA um, to um, talk about what opportunities there might be in a united piece of work. Councillor Murray? Oh, yeah. Isn't that, um, the answer to my question, I think the first thing is that council decide whether they want further activity I think that the state is going to have the problems with the university and the state and the health system. It was really sort of to go down that route. We'll do tax, I think we need to do tax, but I think we need to do tax. Um, the students will pick up the tab and uh, so we have the patients. Uh, so we are the education city, so why do we say they'll pick up the councils? We explain the effect now. So we have two, two universities, we have multiple hospitals um, and education institutions. So we are different from other councils. And I'm sure that we've got a greater rate those two institutions 
the other councils do more than happy to uh, follow us. But at the moment, I think that it would be, I need to watch. We're starting to learn in the university, and we've got to try and get that university as well. I don't think it's a good thing. Well, Mayor, did you? Hi, no? Um, I just would like to see the chair us take this. There are lots of other things in there um, other than raising, and I do think that's probably better than getting right, honestly. Um, but just before we move on from that, I just wanted to see if I could get a refresh on those two rebates. Now, they're not the lion's share. Um, there was a special discretionary and the other one. Um, do we have a breakdown? I don't think I've ever seen a breakdown of that. Are we, are we get a papers tonight? Yeah, for the, the, the other one. Do you say that we will take the opportunity to come back to you on that for detail? Yeah, just if I could get a refresh on that to understand what, what if anything, can or should be um, looked at there. Um, uh, the other thing is, if I can actually bridge the gap between those two discussions about rates and um, property, I would actually suggest <clears throat> that we, what wasn't there is actually the, the lion's share of the rate leakage is the state government owned property. Um, uh, I would suggest we actually talk to them around what their intentions are. I mean, they actually, they own, they are the single biggest landholder of property within the city of Adelaide. They don't pay rent for that property. Um, uh, the benefit is a lot of those visitations are public servants and that's good and they spend money in our businesses as well. Um, uh, but I'd really like to understand what their intentions are. I mean, I mean it's great that we've done a strategic property review and it's fantastic, it's a fantastic initiative and it's very important, but I would suggest that the state government, we need to engage with them and ask them what are they doing with their properties because um, and they don't have rights. And if they're looking to devolve themselves of some of those assets and incentivize private sector development, then I think that's, that would be a really good way for us to, um, uh, to go as well. Um, I just wanted to touch on, if, if I could chair the, so Mr. Booth has mentioned that um, uh, the 1% is, is quite conservative. The 1% in rate subject is quite conservative. Um, do we have any capacity and how do we how do we track that? What is that assumption based off of? Because if you if you actually if you actually have to sorry, I'll just wait for them, I'll just wait for bring in for them. If you, seeing as we understand how many improvements there are, how many development improvements are coming through, and we know what, what, what construction has started, so do we actually predict um, accurately and precisely what the rate uplift is, or are we just saying, oh, we think it could be 1% because we'd like to take the concern about the next year? Uh, it seemed to be an assumption in the long term plan that's uh, adopted as part of the long term planning process. In, in my view, it is conservative, but I'm sure Grace may give you a contrary view. Thank you, um, Chair. So, yeah, the 1% is based on, um, uh, we do look at the developments that come in. The development numbers that come in through the planning process are valued very differently. So, if I have to kind of give you an example of the number that was approved, one of these uh, numbers tonight, the um, arcade redevelopment in there, in terms of the value, is in the hundreds of billions um, in terms of the development cost um, that will be coming through the planning properly. That is not close to the value that we would use for rating um, for that purpose. So whilst we have information coming in through the processes as a council we're seeking through the uh, planning and development consent, um, the costs and, and the values are not necessarily a, a great reliable indicator. So we kind of weigh them up between that information that comes in and the historical information as Mark suggested the historical in terms of just pure revenue uplift, and I say revenue uplift, not rates uplift, but revenue uplift. Um, has been 2 percent. So we kind of break that down then and say, okay, well, what of that is in developments, what of that is changes in valuations um, over those years. And, and last year was one point two five in terms of just new developments. So when we break that 2 percent down a little bit more, we try to choose a more conservative position. So yes, 1.1 percent flat is a conservative position assumption based on a bit of history and a bit of forward information we have through developments. Um, you could lift it. It is a change in assumption that council would have to No, I think I, I certainly, I certainly appreciate how we rate um, and what have you. But I'm just, 
uh, obviously we, we, we have um, worked out what the Central Market Arcade redevelopment is going to give us by way of this. So we clearly have a department that goes and looks at something which, yes, is built and says that's going to generate X by way of rent value when it's done and we're going to rate it with Y. So I know it would be a bit of an exercise, but if we could get a more accurate read by saying, look, this is what this is exactly what's being built, we know exactly what it is. Um, what it would be even be a desktop exercise looking at it and saying <laughs> No, no, I'm, I'm talking about doing a private development so we can get an accurate read on what's happening where and where our rates are different city. So sorry, can I just can I just comment councillor? Um, so Many years ago, um, certainly on the other more, um, I was going to say aggressive, but probably less aggressive, just more streamlined approach um, around uh, the growth agenda for the previous councils. And it's a shame Councillor Lyons left because um, she, she would remember, remember this. Um, in terms of um, understanding what the incoming revenue, particularly from new bills, would be. There was a quarterly review of literally staff walking around the city um, to see whether people had um, moved into apartments and then that would have been captured um, and obviously um, then fed straight back into a financial and then managed much more stringently and much more accurately on a quarterly basis. So there's certainly some things we could do probably a bit more purposefully to make sure that the data um, is getting back in uh, the system in a timely manner. And then in terms of um, reviewing the long-term financial plan, um, as, as uh, Grace has indicated, um, there's always this sort of tension between using historical assumptions and actuals versus um, that sort of conservative approach around making sure um, that we're um, providing counsel with as, you know, the most accurate information that we can. So there is always that sort of balance between trying to trying to manage the tensions. Um, and uh, a couple of a couple of other questions, um, Chair. We talked about the asset sustainability ratio earlier, and and um, earlier on the presentation of the long term financial plan. Um, we're you know, assuming to do 100%. What, can I just be reminded, what are our parameters regarding what is that green figure in asset sustainability ratio? The green figure. Um, okay, 90 to 110%. Um, we're predicting, predicting to do 100%. Have we modeled what the impact would be if we said, look, well, at least for the first three years while we're tight on revenue, we're going to look at the lower range of what we call it acceptable, um, let's say 95%. You could even have a policy whereby you can say, look, while your, while your operating surface ratio is less than 5%, which is a bit touch and go, um, uh, we're going to operate at the lower range of our ASR. Um, has, that been, has that been modelled at all? Thanks for the question through the chair. It's, um, we've done some pretty warm modeling around 80 and 90, um, but we can do that. Um, whether that's the first three years, two years, the whole life of the plan, or whether it's dependent on operating surplus, we can run various scenarios like that. Um, in terms of um, those ranges, are those targets are the, um, because they've got MGA 4 ratios over the MGA recommendation, and now the target of 90 to 100%. Um, some other councils do adopt a policy specifically around these ratios and how they get acquired. We don't have such a policy, but something that I'd like to talk to the council about um, around uh, what you know, how you use these ratios in terms of decision making and, and therefore work within the ranges as opposed to um, what's assuming middle mm -hmm. is good. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not a good science to it. Can I, can I chair? Yeah, I, I did look at um, asset sustainability for. Uh, as, as part of this and other work I've done. And 90% is the government's about a $10 million position. So it's, it, the impact is on, it's a significant impact on borrowings. And I think that the value, if I could add to Grace's um, comments there, would be that um, the policies are important so that you understand the basis on which that ratio is set. So mm -hmm. your asset management plans are four years old, I think, for the yeah. And those assumptions need to be revisited to make sure that you're not just budgeting a number because you're budgeting a number. Yeah. And to me, that's 
that's the most important policy piece that needs to occur to get those uh, ratios into the right shape. Yeah, and no, I, I, I tend to agree just following on from that. Do we do we know what uh, do we have readily available what the infrastructure uh, total infrastructure assumptions are in the start of the future and the long term financial plan? Do we have that total figure? I think it must be in hundreds of millions. I want to say 600 million. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm not going to print the number specifically, but yes, it was over. Um, it was in the late five after you removed some of the things yeah. during the decision. So it was in the five hundred oh, million to the over oh. 10 year plan, uh, oh, yeah. yeah. which is yeah. quite yeah. a yeah. And uh, yes, um, yes. And and do we just wanted to compare apples with apples on this, and I just don't want to get stuck on this because I do have a lot of points, but. Do we know what that was? Because I have a feeling that changed without a decision of council um, some point last year, probably mid last year, because the old long term financial plan, I think, had somewhere in the region of 350, 400 million in there, and then suddenly pops in an extra 250 million. Do we know when that happened? Why? Who authorised it? Um, so the only way the LTP can change is through your council resolution in terms of the public version of them. So it will be done in the QF process or in the process as of last as a result of the previous year's budget allocations. Um, I do understand that we might be able to add some more to this, but I do understand that as much said that asset management plans are four years old and there was a revaluation of them without necessarily redoing the plans to space and adopt the coal outdated but Okay, I'll put questions on notice about that. Um, if I can just get back to the core um, the core of what we're talking about here. What I, I don't want to thank Mr. Booth for the overall presentation. I think it was very good. Um, it summarised a lot of things that we spoke about before and a lot of things that are new. Um, uh, where where I really wanted to see us go with it um, was to have a think about how we can unlock private sector investment. Um, within the city of Adelaide. I think that's the best thing we as government can do. Now, I understand those policy levers are limited, but I'd really love to see some more science behind um, where the rate growth is, um, what sort of rate growth is it? Is, is it residential? Is it commercial? If it's commercial, what sort of commercial is it? Um, and I'd particularly like to see it broken down into the categories that we have in the Local Government Act. Um, uh, for the different types of um, uh, rates that we, you know, you can have a, a shop for this and an office for that, you know, those different rating categories. Um, because those rating categories are our leaders as well. Um, and if we can think about rate growth in that sense, and also marketplace analysis to see, um, okay, we know that there's lots of restaurants popping up because uh, people are going on holidays, they're spending more money in Adelaide on food, going out and having a good time. So do, can we look at that? Um, uh, some other things that I think are, are, are pertinent and that we should consider are around um, how we can make development easier, um, uh, how we can uh, seek, because you know, an investor has, has money to spend and they, they, have, they may have um, equally uh, lucrative propositions in the suburbs and in the city. What are the barriers to investing in the city that do not exist in the suburbs? Because there are, there are substantial, I know our permit fees are higher, I know it's, you know, traffic management is harder, all these sorts of things. Um, so I think that I'd really love to know what we can do there to make development more attractive here. Um, the other thing as well is look, we do have almost $600 million in expenditure on infrastructure. Um, and I acknowledge that uh, wasteful, arguably wasteful expenditure on infrastructure enhancements is part of our problem with our historic deficits. Um, however, you know, if we could take a more strategic approach to how we operate our infrastructure and say, look, go to a go to a main street or go to a precinct and say, well, if, if you are on the cusp of investing, if you do invest, we'll look at upgrading the um, uh, enhancing the infrastructure around you um, on the proviso that you do invest and go into an arrangement um, whereby you can actually yeah, unlock that. Well, 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 actually, Councillor Martin, sorry, Chair, I did ask for this before. Well, I think we're all going to start upgrades. Absolutely nothing to do with what we're discussing. I, I did request this report, so I think I'm probably the authority on what I intended for it to be. Um, uh, these, are, these are the sorts of things. The discussion piece, um, Councillor Martin, so he's discussing the item. 
these are the sorts of, the sorts of things that I wanted to, that I think is, are worth exploring. Um, uh, the other thing is to see if we can lower the very high cost of uh, getting in utilities and infrastructure to new developments in the city. Um, uh, that that is that is a substantial barrier to coming into the city or doing you know a basic housing development in the suburbs. So um, if we can look at those things and make it easier to get more construction, development, redevelopment in the city, I think that's how we can look to see that grow. Um, I think those are my main points. I just want to a few more. Or if anyone else has got a question, so I can answer it. I'm happy to continue the sooner if there's just a bit. Um, Skip thing with this. I just, I just make two points. Um, uh, one, one is a question regarding U Park. Um, if, uh, and I think, I think, I want to many administration I've done before, they are running them more commercially, and I think that's excellent. Um, uh, but how can we, how can we better commercialise the new farm business? Um, it's, we need more KPIs. Would a skills-based board in charge of that to actually run a market business? Um, in Mr. Boots, would that, would that actually help? Um, the 30% member, I think the biggest issue in regards to new park is uh, council has throughout time has used new park members to new guises to support the city. Um, the reality is that we were uh, uh, permitted to follow a route of commercialization of market rate or whatever. You would see higher returns and you'd probably see more flexibility in regards to market mix. As, as it is at the present, uh, yeah. we, we have been a new parks were created for short term parking to encourage people to come into the city to support retail. However, uh, if you look at our competitors, we used to be the market lead, we're no longer the market lead in regards to off street parking. They certainly have a more aggressive, more dynamic pricing structure and the flexibility to be able to respond. For us, when we do ours, when we move to the start of the year, and we're having to come back to council, the market responds very, very quickly in regards to its dynamic. So, so sorry, was that a skills based board would be more dynamic or through your presiding member? I actually don't believe you need a skills based board. I actually believe that you have the uh, excellent staff who can deliver it and it's been proven during COVID where the new park plus where they recovered the business very quickly. Yeah. So, what do we need to deliver then? And, and, and set targets. Uh, Mark, targets. 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 Yeah. So we no, that's yeah. that's good. Um, the other question about U Park is: is that is the U Park business actually um, uh, quantified? Is it has it been valued? Um, I don't want to know what the value is because you probably can't say that. But is it valued and does it appear as a saleable asset? Well, the, 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 the property does. The property does, but the goodwill. It's the goodwill that I'm interested in. Is the actual business valued and does it appear? As something that may be so. Interesting. I remember, no, it doesn't appear as a going concern as, as a saleable business. However, that would be part of a discussion should council ever wish to do it. Um, but noting some of the narrative we said, what way bigger movement and parking is going to look in the future, it would be interesting to see how that transitions over time. Well, through you, Chair, could I urge us to actually, if you're going to run a business, we need to know how your business is worth. Um, I think that's that's. Critical. Um, and the last thing I would just say, just regarding um, the values of investing with the council, um, if you're not going to invest in coal mining, you better get out of car parks pretty quickly because they will use fossil fuels. I think that's just absurd. Councillor Martin. Oh, great. I have a question in relation to the uh, uh, asset ratio, the asset um, maintenance ratio, and uh, the sustainability ratio. In the current financial year, we've been 60% thereabouts. Coming financial year, it's 60% thereabouts. And immediately after it follows us 100%. How is it possible that we don't sustain assets to an acceptable ratio for a couple of years and then 100% of the market in each subsequent year? Um, why, why are we not incorporating that? Alternatively, why are we not emphasising? That the asset management plan has blown up by whatever number of years it is. Thank you, Chair. 
I think there's two points to that. Um, the, when the assets are sustainability actuals come in, they are always slightly different than what we planned. But the necessary thing we fall behind or renewal is going sometimes it just seems to be burnt necessarily classified from the accounting perspective of that real. Um, so we need to understand sort of some of that classification that falls into some of those ratios sometimes. Um, in terms of forward planning um, at 100%, that number is relative to the number of the, the, that value sitting in the asset management plan. Um, the, the asset management plan needs to dictate finances and not the other way around. Um, the, the number that is, that is valued, the value that is sitting in the asset management plan, that the Clinton's been into the chamber for the last few months, we're saying that they need to be reviewed as the asset management plans are being um, reviewed over the course of the next 12 18, 24 months, so as they're being done by asset category, and then the way that they're being valued is being looked at differently as well, um, in terms of looking at what their the replacement value is by um, looking at that as more of a component kind of type detail, whereas at the moment we have a whole asset in there being valued. So the way that asset management plans are built, they're four years old, they are built slightly differently to the way we would say we would want to make sure they're built in the future, which would change the value, which would then make that value, value more so realistic in that sense. Right now, the values that are in there are based on a different method and have that. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Chair, can I just um, uh, make a couple of comments sure. and then that's it for me. Um, I agree with um, the view that was put earlier about taxing the state and federal government entities. Um, that is a serious decision that the council needs to consider. Um, there is a risk of being accused of being a rapacious council if we were to begin taxing, uh, that is applying rates the hospitals, the schools, the fire stations, the police stations, to ambulance stations. It would be seen as a kick in the guts to the community, I think, uh, to be um, taking what are the backbone uh, services of our community and applying charges to them. Um, uh, equally, um, I am deeply uncomfortable about removing um, the rate rebate for pensioners, which has been opposed by a majority in a public consultation, and I am opposed to increasing the discretionary rate rebate to 15%, which has been opposed um, by a vast majority in our public consultation. These are things that are serious political issues that require deep thought and not just a workshop in uh, the manner that we're talking tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, additionally, um, I uh, do not agree, and I would ask the administration that there be a serious and deep discussion before we consider applying special rates for the construction of the products and its golf courses and the like. Um, as my uh, colleagues on the other side there keep telling me, these assets are used by less than 10% of our ratepayers, and mm -hmm. then turn around and say to our ratepayers, you will bear the burden of the cost of this development uh, that is used by uh, a majority of people other than you um, is a insanely dangerous political uh, uh, measure to consider. Um, and I am um, uh, anxious to ensure that the administration will guarantee us that there will be a discussion about any further changes to parking, particularly in relation to applying 10 hour all day parking to parts of the city and to extending that to main roads um, that are currently not uh, either a time to 10 hours or paid parking. Yet it is an extremely sensitive issue, and I know that in North Adelaide it would be opposed strenuously. And moreover, um, I would ask the administration to bring to us, if it is under contemplation, um, the exemptions that Mark is talking about for residents and particularly if we could have a look again at the North Adelaide resident exemption scheme that was killed off by Councillor Duros, that scheme had the makings of being um, a city-wide model and it is at least the basis for a discussion about parking in general. Thank you. I just uh, want to reiterate that it was the council decision, not solely my decision, Councillor Martin. No, no, and sure. I, I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Thank you. Lord Mayor. 
Um, thank you. Just a few comments. And I'm going to go back to those questions. Um, uh, but I will just say that in all these discussions about roads, it was about public and public purpose. So hospitals, fire and fire stations, close schools, etc. It's not. It's when it's, um, a, a piece of land has been is being used for clear commercial outcomes, commercial purpose that we should be looking at ratings. And so, case in point is Sky City, which is a casino yes. on ground land, which is non ratable or the Walker uh, mm -hmm. Corporation government. Mm -hmm. um, so we are, you know, there, there's no intention, certainly not by me, to be targeting schools or hospitals or fire stations, but more those that are being developed with uh, clear commercial outcomes. Um, I do believe that we should be actively pursue strategic property development opportunities, and I think the C there are opportunities in C and D grade buildings. Um, there was a um, a discussion, um, Claire, you've been across this a few years ago through Capital City that we should look uh, jointly uh, acquiring and upgrading a C or D grade building so that we could st step through ourselves any hurdles that they were in, particularly with building code mm -hmm. um, around uh, what we needed to do ourselves so that we could focus on here's a block, we need to remove that red tape. Here's a block, we need to look at how this goes. Um, I still think that's a great opportunity for us to do. Um, some of the work that you were talking about, um, Councillor Hyde, is being undertaken by AIDA. So the Economic Development Agency is working with a group of developers around the city to look at what would incentivise greater development, um, what the hurdles are, what the current blocks are, um, so some of that work has already been undertaken and I know that um, uh, Craig Holden has been very involved in that. Um, what was the other question? Sorry, I've got it here. Um, uh, land acquisition. Um, I, I, I do think that we could look at uh, some really strategic land acquisition. I would suggest we don't hang on to it for 20 years in terms of land banking as we have with previous pieces of land um, because um, I think if we are looking at land acquisition we need to be very strategic about why we're acquiring it and, um, and as you said Mark I think that's a very salient point we do know what the pipeline of development is we do know where the investment is happening in the city and we should be looking for our strategic investments there um, in terms of increasing, I think we've spoken enough about rates, um, revenue, commercial revenue um, from sources. Um, again, it is, uh, I, I know we've had several discussions about what is the, um, what is the next of the business. Oh. No, the next yes. <laughs> Um, but I do actually think uh, that I'd be very keen um, with, with getting much better in terms of just um, city insights, national insights, trends data, um, just to have a, a bit more of a wider um, purview in terms of what is happening on a national or global basis from uh, from other local governments and councils and their investments. And in fact, um, I shot off an email to uh, some uh, the college through Blango just to see what some of the buyers councils are doing um, um, interstate and overseas. So um, thank you for the work. It was very informative and I think there's still a lot we can do. So um look forward to it. Thank you. Councillor Kearns. Thanks Chair. Um, I don't know which council it is Council Martin is referring to in terms of hospitals and schools because it's not this one. But none of us, none of us have thought to extract money uh, to rates from hospitals or schools. The only question mark, as far as I know, is around uh, universities, uh, which is quite rightly pointed out by Mr. Booth, uh, because of the business like nature uh, that's built the university the expansion, the taking over the form of local property. But none of us have been seeking to uh, extract money from hospitals. None of us will seek to do that. And it is a, it is a bit of a, a sad grandstand point. Of um, well, I think this is a really, really great and valuable discussion. I really like the way it was presented. I really like the nuts and bolts, uh, practical um, uh, stressing of, of how we can uh, look at this going forward. Um, 
I'll just leave some very brief comments. Rates proportions of revenue. Um, we've got comparisons with um, other councils here in the state. You can see what's going on uh, in terms of Melbourne, uh, Sydney, and in fact, in general, it's been excellent to get an, you know get sort of the latest uh, views uh, or latest, latest intel on how other capital cities have been maximising revenue and what sort of strategies they can take for innovation and so on. Um, it'd be good to get analysis based on what I would describe as net public good, um, as well as uh, revenue maximisation, because that is a constraint on us as a monopoly provider of local government services. Um, so, you know, if we expand the on street parking, uh, we need to look at a uh, decrease in visitation, for example, and that will affect us directly. But there's a public good element. Maybe a better example is um, uh, expansion of advertising opportunities. Now, we can increase our revenue, uh, but the net public good uh, effect on uh, the amenity of the public space is something we and only we uh, can, can decide upon because of our monopoly power position. So, we, we, we do have a um, sort of a, a public moral constraint um, because of our power. Um, but it'd be good to get, we, we need to have very solid, as we had this conversation earlier, we've got to have very reliable uh, analysis based on visitation rates, impacts on visitation rates, impacts on uh, public amenity, all that sort of thing. Um, but with that proviso, I think there is no reason. I mean, and the, and the other aspect of that is also intruding on the private sector Improve, intruding into the part of the market. Uh, we've got to be careful that we don't use our weight um, in a way that constrains the ultimate, if more, most efficient outcome. We can go and take investments that other uh, uh, you know, uh, entities can't, but we can also correspondingly be a lot less efficient about the way we go about it because we've got that market. Um, but with that provide, with those provisos, I think that it's uh, we we should really continue this discussion in an open uh, and honest way um, because it's uh, it's a good thing to increase uh, revenue. It's, it shouldn't be the only focus. Of course, we have to continue to focus on that efficiency on the expenditure side, um, and we shouldn't necessarily assume that just because we can increase revenue, we automatically uh, we automatically increase the revenue so that it's a balancing. Um, but yeah. Oh. Tom, did you want to add that? Just, just a quick thing. Uh, firstly, thank you to Grace and Mark and, and the system to bring this together. It's, it's been really worthwhile to understand what's happening with, within our own business. But none of tonight was about making any recommendations. Mm -hmm. It is a workshop. None of tonight was about suggesting anything other than these are, these are what were what's obvious to us about the leakage, opportunity, and whatever it's up to council whether well, they wish to keep that on. There is other opportunity beyond this which need to be explored, but as I indicated at the very start of time, what the next commercial operation was, I'd be putting money on it. Um, so from our perspective, we would like to come back. The important piece for us is all the decisions will be made by council. And I think that's important to note. Uh, but the things that we wish to progress is looking at that treasury policy and investment policy so we can actually start to bring some bones and some lead up to, to council decisions when it comes to growing the revenue base. And it's it's not restricted or limited to rates. We're looking at other things. As Mark indicated, rates is only about 50 odd percent of our revenue. So there's other opportunities for us out there. But we will come back to council. Mm -hmm. Sorry, if, if I could add, uh, I did look uh, at the UK, the US, New Zealand, and the state of our resources for local government. And respecting these different regulatory regimes, the common thread is property. So, your next part, uh, if you like, is, is property. If waste management is the other big one, you don't have. Um, an ability to do waste patch other than potential container deposit things, but but it's it is property and, and there are some further things being done around the world, but they are not moving the needle materially like car parking moves your needle, which is why I did focus on property and the fact that you've got a strategic property um portfolio. Councillor Martin. Just a, a point of clarification, Chair. I mentioned hospitals tonight. Uh, only because it is on our papers at page 19, including the foregone range of hospitals. But you also mentioned fire stations as well. Anyway, any, um, any other questions?
No. Um, I just like to say it's really great that we're having these discussions, and that it's only a workshop, but um, it's it's great that we are making or well, everything becomes transparent to what decisions we have to make. Some decisions are going to be hard decisions, um, and some of them, you know, will be political. Um, but um, I think it's really good that this is a report that, or something that the public can see as well in regards to the um, makeup of the council. So thank you for the report. It's really good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.